index conference has started uh, a few weeks ago. We've, uh, have, we have a total of 18 sessions planned. This is our session number 13 today. And it's our third and last panel. And so far we've had uh, uh, 1,000 attendees. Uh, to the conference from uh, 40 different countries, so it's a great success. And uh, and uh, so I'm really happy to introduce uh, Jean-Bernard Thévenon, who is uh, president for our technical section number uh, 16, which is de dedicated to uh, digital transformation in nuclear. And he is also the head for the program committee of the conference. So I give you the floor, Jean-Bernard. Thank you, Valérie, for this kind, kind introduction. <laughs> welcome. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the third round table on the, uh, of the Index Conference Series, <clears throat> which is organized by the French Society of uh, Nuclear Energy. Today, our discussion will focus on how nuclear could benefit from other industries. Um, indeed, the digital transformation currently ongoing in the nuclear industry uh, can take advantage of lessons learned uh, from existing program uh, in other critical industries and then uh, can bench itself. There are uh, some areas where the nuclear is late, other where uh, nuclear is on the wave and sometimes a bit in advance. Uh, so talking about digital transformation is not only a matter of techniques and innovation, but also a matter of transformation and a question about digital data. Transformational programs uh, are usually mid-term programs running over years and uh, having impacts on skills and processes. These impacts must be well evaluated. That's one of the reasons of this roundtable, uh, because this transformation is often not reversible. However, after many years of lessons learned, performance and business increase is no more questionable nowadays. <clears throat> so data is, of course, a tricky topic because it drags value along its own life cycle from the data source to the cloud. And uh, turning data into knowledge is very promising. And maybe the source of new business, however, it has to be regulated in the frame of a future open market for the data. You know, as you may know, in Europe, there is the, the project of having an open market on data. Of course, there is a central question, which, which is the data ownership and control. For all these topics, the question of standard for secure data exchange is a foundation. To illustrate this, we will have three talks. Two talks about the transformational programs showing how data and digital continuity are dealt with examples from back office to shop floor or uh, with site works uh, in other industries. And uh, we will have uh, one talk about the Gaia X project, uh, which is an, op an European association which, which shapes the future of the European data market. <clears throat> These talks and discussion will be followed by a keynote on AI in nuclear. So before I hand over to Mrs. Valérie Faudon, I recall that on your team interface, you have a button with an S on it for Slido. And uh, this button is on the upper banner on the right side. And uh, by clicking on this button, uh, you will be able to, to ask some questions or to rate existing question if you wish. So, uh, Valérie, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm uh, really happy so, to moderate this panel. I have the three uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So, Martine uh, Gourier, who is Director of Digital Users at EDF Group and also at the Board of Directors of uh, Gaia X, which uh, is European Association for Data and Cloud. Uh, we also are welcoming uh, Jacques Bacri, who is the Executive Vice President uh, for digital continuity at Capgemini, and also uh, Fabien Dufresnet, who is Vice President EMEF for Engineering Sales at uh, Aveva. So I, uh, I'm really happy because uh, I, I myself come from a different industry before I joined uh, nuclear. And uh, I know nuclear, we believe we are very special and we are highly regulated, but uh, I think we really have opened ourselves to experiences from other industries uh, in the last years. And uh, I really uh, welcoming uh, this session. So uh, Jacques, um, you've been uh, leading large 
uh, PLM programs in various industries, I think in aerospace, in transportation, so in uh, mission critical industries. So what have, uh, what have we learned? What have you learned? So what trends do we see? What are we already doing now differently than what we were doing at the beginning in these industries? And uh, what are the next steps where, what do we need to improve? Okay. Thank you and uh, hello everyone and uh, and first uh, thanks for this uh, invitation uh, to to give me the opportunity to to give uh, our, our point of view. Uh, I would like today to give my perception on the macro trend related to digital continuity. Uh, but before uh, before that, I think that uh, it could be interesting to define what is it uh, and uh, through some uh, example and also to define uh, where we are as a, as a starting point. Okay. Uh -huh. So to be more precise, I will give you some example of discontinuity impact. And to do that, I will share only one slide uh, because I like to, to give you the, the voice of our clients related to this, uh, to this uh, topic. So uh, it will be better. Uh, I will share my screen in a few seconds. Okay. Okay, so right. <laughs> okay, so here is we take just a few uh, a few examples. Uh, how uh, the, the the clients uh, are coming to to us to talk about this digital continuity and the problem uh, related to to their business. Uh, if you take, uh, I like to take the the case in the industrial equipment, for example. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, some clients in this domain uh, discover that the, the technical uh, uh, configuration related to the commercial configuration are not aligned. What does it mean in terms of business? They are not sure that what they are able to sell to their own clients, uh, they are able to manufacture them because they have a problem in their process and to, to, to manage the fact that uh, what they are selling, uh, they are able to, 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 to build them. Uh, another example in the, in the railway, for example, uh, we, they have a lot of object, a lot of process to, to, to manage. And today we work a lot with our clients to try to, 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 to break the silos because you can imagine when you have to manage all the traffic in the railway, you have to manage the signalization, the design, to design context, all the, all the objects that you have in, the, in, the, in play uh, in this traffic. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, in aerospace, or in shipbuilding, uh, the equipment management has to be very, let's say, uh, managed in the context of the of the structure and uh, and to have a global view of the of the project and the and the asset that has to be uh, to be built. So just to give you some example here, uh, because uh, digital continuity is not a problem only on the problem of the technology. Uh, at Capgemini, we are thinking that. Uh, it's a, a problem of uh, harmonization of uh, process, method, and, and tools. So I will just stop my screen here to share. And uh, this is a very important point to, to, to understand that uh, it's not a question of technology. Uh, so digital continuity, to be simple, it's uh, in my view, it's uh, management of the information flow that you have to manage in the company. So information flow, it's, it means data management is not only pushing data somewhere. You have to control the data that you are managing and thanks to the configuration management. And this is a commonality that we see in a lot of industry. For sure, you have industry which are mature and some, some of all are not digitized enough related to this maturity, but you have to, to need to, to manage the, 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 the exchange related to all the flow of the information before to build a different backbone in your company. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what is common in the different industry to analyze the different process, which will have uh, uh, an impact in terms of uh, discontinuity, you have two main impact, two main criteria to manage. Uh, the management of the volume of the data and the volume of the product that you have to produce, okay? Uh, different industry have a different uh, quantity of uh, object to, to produce and the and the means of production. Okay. The means of production is very important and uh, and the variability also of what you have to produce. 
So before to talk about, you know, uh, information system, backbone and so on, you have really, uh, we see that, uh, and we force our customer, if I could say that, to analyze their process as an information flow related to the means of production. Okay, do they have, let's say, more an engineering to order approach, mean that they have to, to, to build their product or asset uh, in a very specific way related to the ask and requirement from the customer? Or do they have, let's say, to assemble what is exist today in, in, in their stock and to have a make to order approach to, uh, to, to build? Uh, in this case, this is not the same kind of process that we have to manage in terms of uh, flow of information. Okay, so to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be short, there is a, a, a clear link between the way to produce product or asset and the process that you have to implement in terms of uh, continuity management, first of all. Second of all, what is very important in coming to the, to the trend that uh, I would like to, to expose today, we see uh, more and more, and I will give you some example, uh, that uh, the, 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 the way to manage sequentially the production and the engineering related to production is over. Okay? What, you see, what we see in the, in the, in the, in the leaders uh, in the company who are leading this uh, continuity aspect with efficiency, we see that they are using process to manage more and more concurrently the product, the process, and the resource associated in the same way. What does it mean? It means that uh, when you have to design a product or an asset, as soon as possible, it's very interesting to, to simulate in the same time the process which will be used to produce your product or your asset and not to have a second, too much a sequential approach. Doing that, you have a, a way to, to, to reorganize your, your, your teams, your process, to have more a continuous approach because you have to assemble together the data coming from the engineering, data coming from manufacturing, data coming from the production way. So it's very important. So we see the, the state of the earth today. Uh, the leaders are start, starting to do that and to assemble so all the data. Uh, which type of industries are they doing that? Uh, aerospace, automotive industry, clearly. Uh, 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 and uh, they are at, uh, at the level to have uh, to build an overall process because behind that, if you see, uh, for example, Tesla or Panasonic, as of today, they are trying to 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 manage in the same change process management all the different systems that they have to use to produce their product. Okay, you can have a, a good product or good system to manage equipment to have a good system to manage the product that you have to build the car and the equipment for the car. But if you are not able to manage the change process in a consistent way, to manage the impact between the different systems, it will be inefficient to, 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 to at the end to define the product. So the, the, the trend that we see in, the, in some uh, industrial uh, leaders today is really to, to associate in the, in the same change overall process management, all the systems that they have to use in the, in the right way. So it's uh, it's very it's very important this, this point and this uh, current trend that we see today uh, uh, in the in lot of company. Uh, what is also important is to 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 be able to to have an organization to 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 fit such kind of process. Uh, because uh, uh, I will give you an example in uh, aerospace in the big client in aerospace. Uh, we wanted to, to, let's say, to calibrate and to optimize uh, the cadence of the production. So first thing was to, 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 to imagine how we can, let's say, collapse the engineering uh, uh, phase and the, and, the, and, the, and the manufacturing engineering part, okay, to simulate how we can optimize the, the behavior of a, of a station in the factory to, to, to well uh, manipulate uh, some equipment related to the product that they have to build. We spend 70% of our time on the first MVP just to assemble together the data coming from engineering and the data coming from the shop floor. Okay, 70% of our time. Because as soon you want to break the silo and to have a clear, let's say, continuity process to simulate data together because this is where you will uh, you will uh, uh, win times and, and and money. You need uh, if you want to do that, you need to have the right access to the data uh, uh, in the in the in the very uh, let's say uh, 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 fast fast way. So just to rassemble the data 
to simulate together the data with a heterogeneous information. It takes time, and this is where the maturity of some uh, client is uh, is uh, challenging because uh, some clients have, for some of them, have a PLM system to manage, let's say, more or less engineering data. But for the production way, for the uh, uh, operational way, uh, it's another story. We are just uh, at the at the at the starting uh, at the start of the day. So it's a uh, concurrent engineering to manage also uh, such kind of thing. And you can imagine that behind such kind of uh, way to, 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 to move forward, you have to reorganize a little bit, even the validation of what you want to do, because as soon you have defined the right environment uh, to, to define uh, the right process, to simulate faster, to, have, to validate faster your product with the right quality, you need to have what we call integrated use case, okay? which are the transversal use case, which will be able to validate very soon in the process that the continuity uh, aspect are, are well managed. So this is really a, a question of focus here with the right stakeholders, not to try to test uh, uh, as soon as possible all the, all the use case, but to have an integrated use case uh, uh, story to, to validate as soon as possible the transversal approach from the early stage in engineering to the manufacturing and production. So okay. this is an overall uh, view that I wanted to, to give you with few examples, and uh, I will be more than happy to answer to the question later on. Great. So I have uh, prepared questions, but uh, uh, I think I would like to to remind everyone that uh, we are uh, waiting for your questions and that uh, to ask questions, you have to uh, use the uh, S button on the top of your screen. And here you can not only ask your questions, but you can also vote for the questions that have uh, been asked uh, already. So um, let's uh, now talk to, with uh, Fabien. So Fabien Dufresne, so your company has had experience uh, in oil and gas, I think, or projects, especially yeah. in, in exploration, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> And uh, so you have developed data aggregators and uh, understand there are systems to collect existing information on the ground. So it's a really a bottom-up approach uh, to get really a single point of uh, for data. So I really ask you the same questions and the one I asked to Jacques. So what have you learned uh, on these projects? Uh, what trends do you see? And uh, what is being done now differently than at the beginning of the projects and the next steps to improve again the, the projects and, and the benefits? Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you um, uh, for the uh, for the invitation and, and for giving me the, the opportunity to share this uh, this feedback. Uh, yes, as you said, I mean, we're working with uh, with all sort of industries, of course, power, but uh, oil and gas, as you mentioned, uh, chemical, water and wastewater, mining and minerals. So we have quite a few, let's say, uh, use cases that, that we worked on with, uh, with many customers on, on different industries. But it all comes to the, uh, to the same problem uh, that was uh, flagged at the beginning. Data is, the, is a problem, right? It's the solution and it's the problem. Um, data is not scarce. We have a lot of data, whether this is engineering data or real-time data coming from sensors, from the from the plant, so it's it's not a problem of how what is the volume of the data. It is how we're able to uh, to really reconcile this data and get and get something out of that. Um, so we have this uh, data aggregator concept, which is again something you've heard from many people, many vendors, many system integrators or technology partners, which is the digital twin, right? So the digital twin mm -hmm. is really about aggregating the data and giving the user or people access to this data through the different use cases that they, that they really need. The way we, we see the digital twin is a multi-layered approach, right? So it starts with collecting the data that will describe the assets or the process that we want to look at. Whether this description is an engineering description, which means what are the what is this what is the information that's been generated by authoring tools in engineering and design and all sort of tools that are used in the in the engineering phase to describe the asset of the plants as designed and as built and that's the engineering digital twin as well as capturing the data 
the real time data of how the plant or the process or the system is actually doing while operating, right? So this is data captured from sensors, collected and displayed as part of this digital twin. And then you have an operations digital twin. And the two can live together, starting from operations and then including engineering data or starting from engineering and then moving on to, uh, to operations. Then the second layer is when you have modules uh, that can describe the behavior of the data, right? So you're getting to a next level, which is uh, generating multiple scenarios and analysis, mm -hmm. what if analysis mm -hmm. or scenarios of what is likely to happen if things keep on this way, right? So this is where the digital twin becomes the brain of uh, uh, of the of the digital plant or the, the the plant that we've twinned, and we can then enhance it with uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and all sort of things to make this brain a bit more powerful. So that's the second layer. And then the third layer is the visualization, because at the end of the day, we have someone behind something, which is usually a screen that needs to consume this data, right? And uh, as I said, based on use cases, uh, because not every consumer will have the same uh, needs in terms of, of, of data consumption. And then you have all sort of multi-experience uh, 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 scenarios or possibilities, starting with the normal and regular laptop and then mobile devices, or then uh, um, let's say collaboration scenarios with uh, uh, AR, uh, uh, immersive uh, virtual reality, and, and even the metaverse if we want, right? Um, so that's the three layers really. It's capturing the data, it's interconnecting this data, whether it's engineering and operations or the two together, it's adding models, and and uh, and tools that can uh, work on on generate scenarios and and adding a bit more intelligence whether this is artificial or not and then the consumer and then at the end of the day you have a digital twin and it makes really sense when you have people consuming this data and adding their own skills their own experience their own capability as human being so we can then uh, uh, bring the two together I mean the 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 digital world with the experience and the workers world. That makes even more sense when we are in operations and maintenance, where the worker becomes what we call the connected worker. So that's that's the way we address the challenge of data, and it's a it's quite a massive challenge, because you will have many systems, many uh, let's say formats, uh, many standards that will coexist in a complex industrial world, and that we need to then reconcile and and give uh, some some some. Uh, let's say meaningful um, uh, usage and meaningful interpretation of this of this information. Um, we have a we have we're starting to have quite an extensive experience of this digital twin approach, mainly in the process industry, continuous process industries. Of course, oil and gas has been uh, quite uh, ahead of of the others uh, over the last years, especially in exploration and production. They've invested massively in this in these aspects. And we're seeing, let's say, three main use cases where the use of this digital twin really echoes and, and resonates. The first one is during the engineering phase. So anyway, let's assume we're starting from a greenfield project, we're starting from scratch. We will be generating a lot of data, a lot of de deliverables. You might think, well, you have engineering and design tools, so you should be uh, you should have the data, let's say, stored in the same location and it should be easy to access. Yes, but actually in an EPC project or Greenfield project, only 40% of the data is created in engineering and design tools. It's, it's, it's the volume of data that's created is massive. And the challenge here is about making sure the data is consistent, is complete, and is, uh, 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 let's say, accurate and uh, aligned with the requirements uh, of, the, of the project. And that sounds easy, but uh, as soon as you put people, systems, processes, and data together, you have chaos. So it's it's uh, having having the ability to reconcile the data and being able to have a holistic view of my project and understand how complete, coherent, coherent and consistent it is, is uh, is a, a challenge on its own. Then the, the other use case um, is uh, what happens when the the projects is finished and is handed over to the end user, to the owner operator. And then when you're speaking with, let's say, capital intensive industries, again, oil and gas, but chemical refining and power, of course, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this milestone, this very critical milestone of passing on the data or the projects into operations 
is uh, is quite an event on its own, right? And uh, and that's really what prevents the end user from getting into operations and getting the return on investments of the project they've subcontracted to an engineering company. So the 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 the, the let's say the, the 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 smaller the gap between the 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 information handover and the and the operations uh, startup, the better for the end user. And again, you have many cases where it's, we're not speaking about a few DVD CDs or uh, a few, uh, uh, let's say, terabytes of data that are being transferred. We're speaking about hundreds of thousands of documents. We're speaking about months and months of assessing and analyzing the data that is being handed over from, from left to right until the plant first starts up and second, the end user has the entire control of all the data that's been produced. And that can take months, right? So again, using this digital twin to let's say go from a uh, let's say waterfall process of handing over the data from engineering to operations, but do more a progressive handover as data is published, validated, and approved, and being handed over to the end user as the project goes, um, is introducing a lot of uh, uh, very interesting savings. And the last use case, I'm seeing I'm, I'm taking a bit more time than 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 wanted, but the last use case, of course, is operations. And here uh, in the ideal world, we spoke about digital threat, right? So we start from engineering, we refine the information, we, we, we uh, let's say we uh, enrich the information and then it goes to operations. That's the ideal world of a CapEx project, but there's a lot of plants which are actually up and running, operating right now, right? So how do we build a digital twin with something that already exists yeah. and eventually exists in 20, 30, 30 years, if not more than that? So that's the operation side of the digital twin. And here we have, Many interesting use cases as well of capturing existing data, whether this is flat data, whether this is structured data or unstructured data, whether this is 3D models, laser scans, anything. As soon as we have data and we are able to, uh, let's say, to define a, a minimum common denominator, which is the tag or a description or something like that, then we can connect the, the data together based on the single element. And then we can have the beginning of a digital twin, right? As soon as I have a, a, a 3D laser survey of a of the room of a nuclear plant, for instance, and I'm able to high spot that this is a valve and that's the name and this is an equipment and that's his name and that's a high HVAC and that's the system's name, then I can connect this information to all sort of other information I have existing in Excel, SAP or whatever database, right? So we can build from brownfield digital twins, we don't need to have something that comes directly from engineering. It can really come from, from operations. And then we have all sort of use cases. Uh, it's avoid unplanned uh, downtown, avoid failures. I spoke about this brain of the digital twin that can uh, add to the data some, some models and analytics. Uh, we can empower the workforce. That's a massive use case from, from the industry in general. How do we embark new generations? How do we make their experience, uh, uh, let's say, more user friendly? How will this generation be able to navigate through complex plans, complex processes? How do I hand over years and years of experience of skilled people who will retire into new generations? Well, the use of a digital twin is something that can certainly uh, help in this, uh, in this aspect. And I would, I would end with this, uh, with this statement uh, that we got from various owner operators and and this one comes from a chemical customer it says well it's it when you are in operations and uh, when you're dealing with all sort of data produced by all sort of systems with all sorts of maturity if you have a lack of uh, 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 data quality or let's say put it put it this way once the perception of poor data quality is set or is established in an organization it's extremely hard despite all the efforts that you want to, to, let's say, bridge this confidence gap and, 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 and make a, uh, let's say, let's have this assurance that with all the systems you've implemented that the data is trusted or what can be trusted and, and can be used for, uh, for whatever uh, use case, whether this is maintenance or something else. So really bringing this confidence on site while operating that the data is validated and trusted is extremely critical. And again, Digital twin here can help. Uh, it doesn't need, again, I'm insisting a little bit on this idea, it doesn't need to come digital since the beginning. 
the more net, the, let's say digital native, the better. And then we'll have the, the, the all sort of problems and use cases that uh, that were just uh, commented about the digital thread and and all the processes, all the changes that we need to implement and how we need to focus things on on use cases. But it doesn't need to start from the ground, right? It can already be digitized. It can be, uh, let's say, uh, connected, synchronized, and put in context while operating uh, in brownfield. So we can create a, a digital twin out of existing plants or existing uh, assets already. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabien. Uh, so uh, we'll come back to you for the questions. And I uh, just yeah. wanted to remind everyone that uh, to ask questions, uh, you'll have to uh, click on Slido at the top of your screen and then either ask your question or vote for existing questions. We already have Jean-Bernard who has been asking question in a Slido already. <laughs> so let me move to Martin. So Martin, you're working on a very exciting project called uh, Gaia X and you're going to explain to us uh, what it is and uh, it will shape the future of the European data market. And uh, so what is it? And uh, what will be the benefits for us, for uh, our industry? And what can we expect? And when can we expect it? Yeah. You have a floor. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Valérie, for the, for the invitation. And also, thank you uh, for the speech uh, that uh, I heard just now, because it, it was really interesting. So, so thank you for all of that. So yes, I will try to explain Gaia X in, uh, in 10 minutes. So, so it's quite a challenge, but I, I'll try to explain it. Uh, so first, uh, it's um, an European association. So at the beginning, it was initiated in 2020, at the beginning by French and uh, German government, and uh, it tries to provide operational solutions to uh, face the data sovereignty issues in Europe. So it is so it is an association, it is a non-profit association, uh, it is based in Brussels, uh, and uh, now, so at the beginning there were 22 founding members, so EDF was, was, uh, was one of the 22 founding members, but now it has more than three, 350 members coming from uh, all over Europe. Uh, so men, uh, well, a lot of uh, French and German members, but also coming from uh, all, uh, all other parts of Europe. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, it works uh, on an open architecture based on the principles of uh, federation, distribution, and decentralization. So a player, a member who adheres to GaiaX, can participate. For example, uh, Jacques uh, Capgemini is a player, is a member, and we have a lot of uh, good uh, partnership with uh, Capgemini, with uh, all, your, all your staff. Uh, and um, and uh, we have also local hubs, local projects, and open source community to collaborate and to build the building blocks and rules and to build the standards. And there are more than uh, so local hubs are local parts of the different countries that work with GaiaX, and there are more than uh, 17 hubs. That means that we have 17 countries helping to help to, to build uh, these uh, standards. Um, I go back to the uh, why we have this association. And uh, the, the first point is to explain the point of the cloud market. So first point, uh, cloud market is very big. So you know that uh, in Europe, uh, so it is really so it is a market that is uh, really increasing exponentially. So more than 25 percent of increase per year, mm -hmm. and in uh, 2027, it is expected to be uh, bigger than the telecommunication market. So you well quite a, quite a lot of um, money. So 250 billion euros at European scale is expected. Expected. Second point that uh, the second point is the point that uh, right now we have three big players, and uh, the three big players have more than 70% of the market. So if we do nothing at European level, the point is that you know very well this point that the winner takes all. <laughs> if we do nothing at the end, it will be 
100% of the market. And this is an issue because there is, there is a point of uh, sovereignty and uh, the users must, must have a uh, take back control of their data. So what is doing GAIX in such uh, markets? GAIX is developing standards so that there is security. So security is very uh, strong point. Transparency, interoperability, portability, on control over the data. So this is quite a challenge because you need, and especially, for example, for the nuclear industry, and uh, Jean-Bernard explained uh, explain that, you need to be safe, secure, you need to take control of your data, and you need not to be stuck on one supplier. So this means that when you, you have to have the choice between different suppliers coming and uh, when you so when you have your data in uh, one cloud, you want to, to take your data back or to put that in another, in another cloud. So that's the point. And this is a real point on, uh, on uh, interoperability. So GAIX is helping to have such standards to have to have uh, well those uh, security, transparency, and so on uh, uh, criteria and standards. Is it clear for now, Valerie? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, and uh, and now I have to explain the notion of data spaces. Uh, well, a data space is a virtual space where different users and different companies can exchange data in a secure way in order to provide value. And GAIX is helping those data spaces uh, on the technical specifications again. And uh, we have different verticals uh, even coming from different markets. And for example, I am leading uh, the energy vertical for GAIX. And we had, for example, yesterday, we had a very uh, good meeting with uh, more than 22 companies coming from all over Europe, uh, nine different countries. So. Uh, large companies, SME, academics, and so on. And all together, we uh, build use cases, we develop projects, and we uh, all together develop and uh, provide a new use cases. Uh, for now, what we are working on uh, electromobility, local energy communities, renewable energies, uh, and we are trying to work uh, with nuclear. <laughs> so, so that's uh, so, so that's um, that's a big point, and um, so we have this vertical on energy, but there are a lot of uh, different sectors. We have a, a health sector, for example, so you know that, so for example, uh, for health, and we knew that uh, during the COVID, COVID uh, crisis, mm -hmm. uh, yes, we need data to, to, well, to deal with a pandemic and so on, and you need to exchange data also on health sector. So you have a lot of uh, health companies, for example, Philips is a, a big member of, uh, of, uh, of GAIX because they need to, to exchange this data. You have more Mobility, you have to exchange the data for your journey between the, uh, the airplane company, the train company, and so on. So they exchange data. And so you, we have, uh, for example, uh, Air France and uh, so in France, Air France and, uh, and, and SNCF, uh, who uh, made a consortium and uh, they have created an association called uh, EONA X. Who is uh, so this um, association is working on a use case related to mobility. We have cars industry, so there is a big consortium called Catena uh, X. Uh, this is uh, mainly the German uh, car industry, so BMW um, uh, and uh, all these um, main uh, so uh, cars industry and also. So Stellantis in France has joined them uh, recently and they exchange data also uh, to, to have um, a lot of use cases. And you have a lot of uh, examples like that. So uh, and, uh, they built their data spaces upon this cloud, uh, which is sovereign and self and secure and portable. Um, so, well, so this is a work in progress. And so I wanted to uh, explain also what, what is GAIAX and what is, it, what is it not. So what it is, it is an association and it is developing standards and software to help the different industries. What it is not, it is not a cloud provider. 
So uh, and now it's important to say that because a lot of people think that it is a cloud provider, but the cloud provider themselves have to develop themselves using the standards. GADX will help, but will not be itself a cloud provider. And to uh, to finish to explain, ten minutes. So I'm good. <laughs> Uh, what is the dev doing in uh, such a field? So we try to develop uh, use cases together with different companies. Uh, so uh, and uh, we have uh, different players. We try to to work with them. We develop, of course, the energy transition and the decarbonization of energy, which of course includes nuclear energy. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you, the three of you. So uh, we're starting to have questions. Great uh, insight, though. So uh, uh, I'm going to start and uh, ask a question, which is, uh, are you seeing some uh, mission critical industries uh, right now putting their data in the cloud? I, so who wants I can to answer that. Uh, I can answer that, Valérie. Because the point is really this point, because we need to have uh, um, uh, we need to have development of this sovereign cloud. This means that uh, if, so we believe that uh, if uh, we have critical and sensible data, they cannot go to the public cloud like that. Okay. They need to be in a sovereign cloud with more specific standards. And we have uh, such uh, uh, cloud service, service provider in Europe, but for the time being, they have only 1% or 2% of the market because the bigger one in Europe is, for example, T-System, 2% of the market. Then oh, you have uh, okay. all... <laughs> so, <laughs> you understand the point. <laughs> I understand the point. Uh, do you want to add something, Fabien, Jacques, or you agree? <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, especially when we're speaking nuclear, uh, I think uh, uh, Martin is, is making a good point. Um, now, let's, it's, it's also a strong trend uh, to, uh, to, uh, to work more with SaaS technology to have a better data sharing across organizations, especially when you're speaking international collaborations. Mega capital projects in oil and gas, for instance, are already in the cloud, right? So the, the data sensitivity is definitely not the same and i understand uh, all the, the concerns with uh, with uh, things such as uh, uh, military or, or or nuclear use uh, or storage of data but uh, you need to uh, to uh, to understand that the supply chain or the let's say the entire ecosystem of some industries is far wider than the one we're seeing in some other industries where we're staying more in the, in the, in the given country or always with the same Kind of players, right? So, uh, so some industries are, will be will have a, a higher appetite for cloud because they have a higher distribution of work and a higher necessity to collaborate and share data. But that's, of course, I mean the the challenge remains as um, as uh, as uh, said by Martin for for some specific industries such as nuclear. Okay, but the Jack, point also yes. uh, what I want. I wanted uh, just to, to explain also that the cloud, uh, in fact, as you, Fabian said, is a very good technology. It is why we ha it has such a success. Huh? success so it success. means that everybody needs to go to the cloud because it's good to go to the cloud. Great. Jack, you want any comment on this? Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with the, what has been said, but uh, if I could add, um, is the fact that uh, no debate on the, on the move to cloud of uh, all the industrial and the uh, clear separation due to the data sensitivity. Uh, what is important is also to, to demystify a little bit because uh, um, uh, it will be uh, uh, doable, it will take time. Uh, but we'll have a manage to manage a very complex question, which is a hybrid, what I call hybrid cloud, because you will uh, will have not all those companies with their ecosystem moving one shot to the Merveus uh, uh, SaaS mode on the cloud. Uh, they have technical constraints, uh, mainly with uh, uh, authoring tools and so on. So, and and probably my my um, my view is that uh, for a long time we will have to manage hybrid cloud, meaning a, a hybrid environment managing uh, let's say the target and and the current situation, and the complexity will be there. How to how to combine these two kind of environment? Thank you. 
in my point of view. OK. So another question. Um, uh, of course, in nuclear, we believe we're very special because we uh, highly, highly regulated. <laughs> Um, so does this mean that we can use the same standards that other industries are using, or do we need our own specific standards? I mean, you've been working with uh, also other industries that are highly uh, regulated, so have they developed their own standards? So what is your view on that? I can then tell you what you are doing with, uh, within uh, GAIAC. So we try to have common standards because uh, because uh, we do not think it's uh, too specific and we need to, to, we need, so for example, for the European um, cloud, we uh, try to merge SECNUM cloud uh, standards, uh, which is a French standard, with C5, which is a German standard, and all the other standards. And in fact, we are working with, uh, for example, I, I'm working day per day with Airbus uh, for the automobile industry. And we are, we are trying to have these standards all together so that there is a market. Because uh, at, at the end, uh, if there is a sovereign cloud for the sensible data, because uh, of course, if, we, if you have non, you can we can have non-sensible data uh, to put in the to put in the cloud. But we need to have a market, yeah. and if it is only, I would say, the nuclear market or the automotive market, or so it's uh, not so easy. So it's uh, better to have common standards. Uh, if, I, if I could add something, uh, uh, I think it's a question also of uh, cost and effort, uh, because uh, uh, today there is a lot of effort to try to harmonize some standards in different domains. Uh, in our side, we are working, for example, a lot uh, with the uh, OPC Foundation to, uh, to for the manufacturing side, for example, to try to harmonize, and it will be very useful for uh, for standardize uh, digital twin in the, in the manufacturing world. And how to connect all the IoT staff, all the equipment, and so on. So it's a question of effort for sure. This is also this uh, sensitive uh, question uh, everywhere. But uh, uh, to try before to reinvent something, I think uh, you have to to see what's uh, what's happened in the different consortium standardization uh, uh, before to decide to do something else. Uh, there's so huge effort also in uh, autonomous driving. Uh, we see with some uh, industrial company in the automotive industry. So there is a really an important effort on this standard to renew also and to, let's say, reshape a little bit hein, because it's not uh, completely uh, 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 optimized. But it's better, in my point of view, to try to optimize what it exists instead to reinvent something else. OK, exactly. So we have questions coming about um, stories, uh, asking for stories about projects that have uh, failed, um, uh, whether they have failed uh, due to uh, organizational resistance to change. <laughs> Sounds familiar, maybe. <laughs> and uh, also um, examples of you know what what were the reasons besides uh, organizational resistance to 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 change and. Have you been exposed to projects with large uh, orders of magnitude? So what is the issue? What have you seen in terms of order of magnitudes and cost for project failures? No, I can I can give you. I will not give names. No? If you want to <laughs> have names of company, I will not. No, but uh, more more seriously, um, uh, to just to have a, a look in what's happened in the past. Um, if you see, because I see the question related also to PLM and so on, uh, the last 20, 30 years, we, we, and I was part of the, of this, uh, of this, uh, let's say, uh, dream. We say, okay, PLM will solve everything in the, in the, in the, in the, in the right time and so on. The problem that we had at this stage, uh, is the tunnel effect for such kind of transformation project and the associated cost. And very often I have heard in my, in my care that, uh, the, the benefit expected was not there. And uh, if you if you analyze uh, 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 why, okay, the technology can involve and so on, but I, I think it's more close to the what has been asked here uh, in terms of organization and the way to transform how to to let's say to accompany this effort to put in place a PLM or an ERP to uh, to in in the company. And I will give you uh, uh, two examples. Uh, what we 
since let's say uh, five, six years, we have developed uh, 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 one, one approach at Kergemini, which, which we have called Drive to, to, to let's say to combine and to accompany our client to implement such kind of PLM project. What does it mean? It means that uh, we, have, we have tried to, to give some tools and not only a theoretical method, but also to have uh, 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 tools to help them to deploy with uh, with an iteration and uh, with an agile approach uh, the, the PLM system and to measure the value at which uh, at, at uh, different steps. And to do that, you need also to, to accompany the change. What does it mean? It means that uh, you have very often people in some organization who are look at their local benefits instead to, to see the, 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 the global benefit for the company. And this is one of the main, uh, uh, let's say, a challenge that we have to solve. And if you have, since the beginning of the project, an approach where you put the transversal approach as a, as a pillar of the, of, the, of the deployment of the tool, you force somewhere to have a governance and transversal governance and organization to look at the value globally for the deployment of what you are doing in terms of, uh, of, uh, of a product. So global instead of local, the right governance, okay, so it's not easy, huh? it's not, uh, 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 it's, uh, uh, it can take uh, some time, but uh, uh, in some cases we have worked, for example, uh, a lot before to start a transformation project, during six months in some transformation project, to build a machine to build a machine to produce the project, you know, uh, before to, uh, to, to, to start and to say, okay, we'll do the project with pilot and so on. You need to really to think, to engineer your machine as a factory to build a project with the right method, the right governance, the right organization, and to be able that you have the stakeholders with you. It's, uh, yeah, just uh, to, to comment on, on, on this question, um, again, no names, but uh, but I think that the the more you are intrusive into the the backbone of the of the data governance of the of the of the data warehouse and and the the data creation and management processes of an organization, the more you're intrusive, the the, the thicker the wall and the more the big uh, the big headline of a failure. Right? The less you're intrusive, the less risks, of course, you, you're you're taking to uh, to uh, to go to a complete crash. And and the sooner you will have a return on 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 experience. So uh, again, I'm not going to comment on PLM on the data aggregation side. I can't really comment on the major failure, but yet some projects have not gone the exact way they were they were meant to. And the and the problem is usually when again the use case of the the person that will consume this data or digital twin when this use case is not solid enough. Then the adoption is is going to be a problem, right? So the it's not a big bang failure, but it's then the project that will little by little, let's say, extinguish and and eventually disappear if nobody really put it back on on track. So the the definition of the use cases is important. Now, rather than speaking about failures, let's if we talk about successes, and I'm not going to showcase anything here. I can't share a link or anything. But if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I just Likes an article that's a use case that we published yesterday. It's on BP, and you will see that BP has built a digital twin of a massive uh, uh, offshore platform in the in Azerbaijan, the, in the Black Sea, and they've built this digital twin in five months. Right. So in the in a short period of time, you can have massive successes if you have a good governance, good use cases, and you have the sponsorship within the organization to really uh, bring this this project forward. Actually, there's a question about um, digital twins. It's what what happens when you, you mentioned Fabian the importance of the quality of the data and the trust yeah. in the data. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what happens when the real world system being model deviates from the digital twins uh, representation? So, how can you, you work that out? <laughs> well, the short answer is we reconcile the data. So, uh, the I think it's uh, I don't I don't have the the magic recipe, but uh, but I think the the starting point is 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 being aware of the discrepancy, right? Is being aware or having being exposed to the to the difference or the deviation of the data. 
So as long as you are able to say, well, that's, I mean, for a given system or for a given equipment or for a given instrument, these are all the attributes that describe this equipment or instrument. And they all come from different sources and they might have different values, right? As simple as that. Your process will decide who is the owner of the data, if it's the pin ID, if it's anything else, the data sheet or whatever, right? So who is right? And as, as long as you know who is the master and where is the discrepancy, then you can take corrective actions. But not having visibility of the data being inconsistent is the is the major source of, of, uh, of, of issues and failures. Now that the plant is operating and has a different value, right, or a different uh, 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 attribute or whatever, the digital twin doesn't stop once it's published the data coming from different sources. It can be constantly fed by operational data or real-time data to say, well, wait a second, I was designed in such way, but in reality, I'm behaving in this way, right? So as uh, again, it's also, it's, all, it's only a problem of being exposed to the information and then defining the, the processes, the workflow and the governance to decide who's right and who, what is the, what is the, let's say the, the master data. And as soon as you have that, then you have trust. Now there's another question on that. Uh, um, asking specifically when some, uh, some data updates are uh, uh, synchronous and other data updates are not synchronous. What is the impact on the configuration management? So uh, I, I, I can I can give some uh, some view on that. Uh, you know, uh, it's really depending of uh, uh, what you want to accept as a compromise on, uh, on the, and what you want to, to not accept. Um, uh, uh, in a, in a, for some phase related to the business development of a product of an asset, you have to to not accept some discontinuity and mainly related to configuration management. As I said at the beginning, it's not a question of pushing data or, or only like that. You need to control the change uh, that you are doing in engineering or manufacturing and production. It means that uh, the, the the variability and configuration management has to play a role because you are able to, to, to manage the commonality and what is, let's say, flexible to be changed in different situations. Uh, when you are managing, uh, uh, for example, a car or, or, or an airplane, you have to imagine from scratch the variability of what you are building. So not doing that, you will not be able to manage the impact and, and, uh, and the commonality of uh, what you are doing. So to be, to be, uh, to be short, uh, not managing configuration, you will have uh, an impact, which is an amount of data. You will be able to, because each time that you will be, uh, you will have to manage differences, you will have to duplicate the data. So at the end of the day, without configuration management, you will have a huge amount of data and you will not be able to manage really the impact related of the modification, engineering change and so on. So it's a key foundation that you need to implement up front. Okay, great. So I have time for one question now. So I will bring the Jean Bernard's favorite subject because Jean Bernard is a fan for uh, knowledge management. <laughs> so the question is, um, how can we turn data into knowledge? Uh, what is the next step and uh, how do you see it? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's 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 a very good one. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it's a it's it's when coming back to my tiered approach of this uh, of this digital twin. I mean, once you have the data exposed, then you have models and and tools and analytics to add a bit a bit more intelligence. But at the end of the day. Uh, it needs to 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 interlock with uh, with human uh, uh, insights and and human skills. Um, I think knowledge, uh, the way we see it, is is really on uh, how we make this knowledge transfer between uh, experienced people to new generations. How do we embed a bit more of so to say intelligence into uh, let's say flat data or models so people can can have a bit more of advices and and, uh, and 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 let's say assess the situation with a bit more depth than just looking at something that's uh, that doesn't talk to them so it's it's we the way we like to look at things and we're working with our customers is knowledge transfer 
And knowledge transfer is the sum of many things, is data, is procedures, is experience, and how do you digitize the experience is based on training. So everything related to training and, uh, and, and exposing people to cases so they can grow their own skills is, is the way we address it, right? But it's not, it's not a, a direct, let's say, data to knowledge uh, 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 shift. It's, it's how do we combine everything and we make something sustainable for people to learn faster. Great. Thank you very much. So all of you, that was a really interesting se session. And uh, so we are going to have a, a break now uh, for 15 minutes uh, into our next session, which will start at uh, 2.15 uh, Paris time, CET time. And so we will find the link uh, in your Outlooks, or you will also find the link in the um, in the chat to the next session. Thank you very much, all of you. That was really nice. Thank, um, you. Thank, bye you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.